Welcome to the Hustle or Bust podcast powered by Paver Art. Our mission is simple, to dive deep into the world of entrepreneurship, small business, and all the success, struggle, and challenges that need to be confronted in the pursuit of growth. We celebrate the entrepreneurial spirit, but perhaps most important, we want you to learn at least one idea that you can put into action immediately to make your investment in time worthwhile. In this episode, we deal with the one element in life where we are all created equal, time. We all have 24 hours in a day. How we manage this precious asset is up for debate and and a challenge for all businesses of all kinds. We dive into various realities, challenges, and a few tools to deal with making the most of the time we have. Let me give you a story to kick off uh, this podcast. So Dom and I were, were walking the dogs, Bruno and Mickey, and what was this, two days after uh, you got out of high school for the summer, we're walking the dogs, and Dom says something to the effect of, I don't know how I'm going to get it all done this summer. Get, get done what? Well, I want to do Blender, which is a video animation software thing. I want to get right. some project done with that. I'm going to take this Harvard course on video game animation. That's a 13-week course. I'm going to work at Paver Art. And maybe you want to have some fun and all that. So classic time management thing. You got X number of hours to do it, right? And how do you get it all done? So I said, all right, well, let's start breaking it down. You've got 24 hours in a day. You've got to sleep, right? So, and you should never cut your sleep short. At least I don't believe you should. So you got eight hours of sleep, let's just say. So you got 16 hours left. If you start mapping out 16 hours a day over the course of 65 days or however many days there are sure. in the summer, And you actually start plotting the time. All right, if you want to do Harvard for two hours a day, maybe five days a week. And you start, you're going to be at Paveroar, and that's a 14-hour slug of time between the commute and the time here. I'm going to venture to say you're going to look at that calendar. If you do that exercise, you're going to have your goals are way too light. Yeah. Right? It's amazing how much time. And I don't know if you've seen on your your phone, Apple tells you how much screen time you have during the day. Yeah. I'm pushing seven hours a day on screen time. Mm. Now, a lot of that is email back and forth. I'm using my phone all day. But I can guarantee you there's three hours of wasted time. But anyway, Dom's different because Dom doesn't have the phone ringing all day. So his time is completely expendable where he can do things like that. But anyway, what it started me thinking about is time management. I think everybody struggles with time management. So that's what we want to talk about today, which is how do you use your time both as a small business owner, a leader within a small business, and just a normal person? How do you be productive with the overall catch-all of time management? Great point. I think it's safe to say that most most kids coming out of high school probably don't have a grasp on this. They haven't they haven't refined it or honed it, but they've been exposed to it whether they like it or not. If you're in sports, there's time management involved. Mm-hmm. If you go to school, there's homework involved. Uh, there's all sorts of things that you try to get done during your day. Yeah, you're not committing them to paper. You're not making a list. You're not doing check marks and things like that. That's a little bit more sophisticated. Um, but anyway, uh, as an intro to this, uh, uh, hello everybody, welcome. This is Hustler Bust, powered by Paver Art. I'm Mike Bull. He's Mark Olivito, and this is where the old school meets the new school. Uh, and today's subject is time management. Uh, I think this is a, a terrific topic to talk about. And, you know, one of the first blog posts that I think you wrote was, why don't you talk about that? It was called, what was it, the and then? Yeah. Talk about that concept, because I was intrigued by it. The, uh, I actually wrote this on a plane on the way back from California, visiting my, uh, my daughter and my son-in-law and our, uh, you know, and, uh, I, I was thinking, because I'm, I'm competing against the blog master. I mean, you are the blog master. You've written... Over 200 blogs, and then I think you've written 30 of them for paver art, or 30 plus of them for paver art. So I'm thinking, you know, I got to do something here. I can't, be, I can't be left in the dust. And I also want to be able to say I've written a blog. Right. At any rate, uh, I, I always had this th- this concept, this theory, if you will, and it was called and then. <clears throat> and the whole idea behind it was that uh, whatever you do every day you're making hundreds of decisions. If you own, manage, uh, 
are seriously involved with uh, handling a small business, the whole concept of and then is really, really important. And it's the, you know, it's the ability to deal with all the and thens. Now, what do I mean by and then? What I mean by and then is, I'll give a small example. You get up in the morning, you have to get, you got you take your shower. And then you go downstairs and you, you eat your breakfast. You have to decide what you're going to eat for breakfast. And then you have to go out to your car, get in your car, drive to work, you look at the gas, you know, you look at your gas gauge, your gas gauge is, you know, it's a quarter tank. And then you have to make a decision. Do I stop and go get the gas now? Or do I wait till I get to work, maybe do it at lunch, do it afterwards when I'm on my way home? Uh, once you've made that decision and then you've got to, you know, okay, which way am I going to work today? Well, I'm going to go the normal. Oh, wait, I can't because there's, you know, the radio is telling me that there's a, there's a jam up or as the guy says, a jam on, on, on 95. When you add up all these and thens, and it's basically defined as dot, 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 and then micro decisions. dot, 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 micro decisions all day long. Um, and I, I related this to my father, who I, I know for a fact. I, I know this because he used to, he used to, uh, you know, hit me over the head with this all the time. Don't be intimidated by by big projects. Big projects are just a series of small projects that add up into one big project. Simple concept. It should be learned by every. 16, 17, 18 year old prior to them leaving school. Okay, mm-hmm. they should be teaching concepts, and concepts like that. Exactly. Yeah. But the whole concept of and then is that you're doing this all day long. Okay. And the the ability to take and boil down that big project into a series of small projects is just a series of and thens. But you have to manage them. You have to prioritize them. You have to go through that process. You're thinking through all of that, and that's what that that's what that blog was all about. In you know, uh, so, how do you how do you relate that to being a general manager of a small, high growth business? That concept, because well, those two things are what I view that, which I think is great. You know, breaking big projects down into its component parts. That's great, up until the point when the phone rings, in a small business, and that. The shit hits the fan. Excuse my French. So how do, you, how do you relate the two? Running, keeping the wheels on the bus with that concept of and then and project management. Prior, you know, prioritizing is absolutely key. We know what we have to do. That are the we know those things that are the most important things that need to be done here every day. Um, I think you and I would basically set those those standards as being the phones. Those phones ring. That's money. That's potential sales. We have to take those phones take priority over everything. But I also know that uh, we've got two new guys coming in. Okay, they're going to have to be scheduled for their work. Well, we're going to have to delegate that that responsibility to a couple of other people to make sure that that gets done. But we want to make sure that they understand what items we feel are important for these new guys to learn unless they unless they've got some ideas on that. But from a prioritiz- from a prioritization standpoint, uh, you know, I think that's number one, and that's 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 absolutely key. In fact, when you and I were talking about this show, we talked about this yesterday. There were we outlined kind of three things that we thought were priorities here. One of them was those phones. Um, um, the second one, I believe, was uh, you know expediting shipments, getting stuff out the door. You don't generate income until you get stuff out the door. Right. Those phones are tied directly to deposits. That generates income. Uh, the, uh, uh, the third thing was the, uh, you know, uh, the running of the business, the, you know, the, uh, the, the component parts of what goes on out back. You know, the equipment's got to be running properly. The, the guys have to know what their responsibilities are and where they work. All these things take precedent, but at the end of the day, you may have a list of three or four things that you've got, and we've written them down, a list of three or four things that you've got on your checklist for that day. You may only get two done because those phones never stop ringing right. from 7.30 in the morning until 6 o'clock at night. Right. So they're competing with each other. Exactly. So the phones are competing with whatever projects you might think about. Yeah, but, but at the same time, like you've said... 
You got to get the phone. Right. Okay. All that other stuff goes by the wayside when that's being dealt with. Well, for but you have to remember that you know you've got to come back to what it is that you needed to get done that day when those phones aren't ringing for right. the ten minutes that they're not ringing. So the so. small business owners, right? So you've got you got to keep the lights on. Right. Right. So for every small business owner, cash flow is absolutely the king of all businesses. So generally, that's your customers your sales, your customer service. To your point, we view the phones ringing as the customer. That's our lifeline to Correct. landscape architects, contractors, homeowners. That's the cash flow. That's the start of cash flow. Mm-hmm. That's competing with any other things that we want to do. If a machine breaks down, if guys need us in the back, then all of a sudden you're getting pulled away from the lifeline of cash flow. If you're a small business with lean resources, sure. and there's only one or two people that might be doing the phones or the, uh, the sales-oriented activity. So it's almost like you've got if you're a manufacturing business, you've got sales, and then you've got, I hate to use the term, but you got the front end of the business and the back end of the business. The sales customer facing piece and the operational manufacturing component. Correct. Both are critical. Yep. Both don't survive without each other, but they do compete with each other. When that phone rings, you got to make a conscious choice. Are you going to focus on that? We generally focus on the phones. Exactly. Right? Um, that doesn't mean we're not involved in operations. We are. But- well, let's take a real time, real issue that came up yesterday afternoon late. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the time management involved with trying to fix that issue. We have one of our cutting decks that went down. And what does that cutting deck do? That cutting deck, it's the, the performance of that cutting deck every day is critical. If that's not running, we're not cutting anything. If we're not cutting anything, you know, we're not sending product out the door. If we're not sending product out the door, we're not getting paid. Snowballs. So, uh, the idea here is how are we going to, all right, wh- what are we going to do now? Those phones, you know, it's not like you can send a note out to the ether sphere. And Everybody say, stop. Don't call. Right. Please don't call for an hour. Right. Okay. No, that's not going to happen. In fact, what usually happens is that more, that, that more phone calls are going to occur. It becomes more, you become more acutely aware of the fact that, my God, that phone's ringing off the hook and we got to get this problem solved. The idea here is that we've got to get that problem solved this morning. Now, we've got a meeting scheduled for 740 with the gentleman that's, uh, that should be able to help us with that problem. Uh, it'll be an all hands on deck. But what we're going to do is we're going to split the responsibilities. Somebody's going to be out there with those guys as they're talking to the mechanic that we need to speak to in regards to getting that machine fixed while somebody else is manning the phones. Now, uh, take, five take, years ago, I that would have been about, impossible. I was just about to say, go okay. back six years. How would this have worked? Well, it wouldn't have worked. What would have happened was myself and uh, Brian, our our, uh, uh, production superintendent, would have been up to our necks in trying to get that problem fixed because we're the only two that would be responsible for that. We were the only two that were here for the longest time. I think that's pretty common in the world of small business. Two guys, everything goes on hold until you fix that problem. Now, this is why... You know, this is why they invented uh, uh, answering machines, okay? Right. And at the time, I, when we were to a point where I could break away and come back in here, there might be five messages on there. And then I have to go through the process of answering those, answering those messages. But now uh, the problems don't go away, but the responsibilities have now been spread over twice as many people. And in a small business like this, twice as many people means one deal. more guy, right. okay? So... Uh, that, that's how that's that's how that's going to get dealt with. We'll still answer the phones, you know, in real time, but we're also going to be responsible for taking care of that problem out back, and that's got to get taken care of immediately. Well, there's this kind of a phrase that you've got: you're either working on your business or you're working in the business, right? Okay. So for a small business owner, working on the bit, working in the business right. is taking care of the phones, solving the operational challenges that you have, mm-hmm. keeping the lights on, keeping the cash flow. You can grow the business that way if all you do is work in the business. But working on the business is different. Working on the business means you're going to take a step back. And you're going to say, here's where we want to be one year down the road, two years down the road, three years down the road. It's a much more accelerated growth pattern. And what are the things that we're not doing today that would enable us to get to that point? That's working on the business. So what you're saying is that's that's as crucial to the business as if you want to any of the other precepts that you're working yeah, on so every day. It is if you want to grow. So remember we talked about the bell curve that you know you got 70% of the world is just going to be kind of stasis. They're going to they're going to survive, they're going to make a nice living. Mm-hmm. Uh, they may or may not be satisfied with that. But in life there's 10 to 15% of the people, individuals, businesses that want to grow. 
They want to go from $2 million in revenue to $3 million, and they don't want to take 15 years to do it. Right. They want to pull the future forward in a rapid pace, grow, reinvest back in their team. That doesn't happen if all you do is work in the business and solve the phones, solve the problems of the day. You need a strategy to do that. You, you need resources. An, you, don't, you don't have an infinite, an infinite amount of time to deal with this. Right. You have a very fixed period of time to deal with it. How do you deal with that? Well, you've got it. Number one, it's it, which is why I said I'm interested in six years ago, it was just you and Brian. Right. You, know, you had the front end and the back end, the two leaders, and you had some level of support, but not a lot. Mm-hmm. That was the business. You, let's just say four people. Right. How in the world do you work on the business when you got you, The truth is, it's really hard to do that. Right. You exactly. Know, pay for it, let's just say 15 years. Pay for it was in stasis, I think you called it, for 15 years. Survival so, mode. Survival mode. Sustainable. Right. You had profits, but you weren't able to step back. Not enough resources to step back, right. work on the business, and take it to a new level. Right? Pro, being proactive in the business at that time was, yeah, you can only throw so many hours at something before it. it's just you can't throw any more hours at right. it. So, so what you got to do, and, and this usually, not not usually, but with a change of control. So I came in and I bought the business. What, what I The first thing I said there is, all right, how can we take stuff off the people's plate? Mm-hmm. You've got all the w- ability in the world to grow. But if you're doing QuickBooks for five hours a week, maybe we can take that off your plate. If you're doing shipping and receiving things that are typically operational and logistics, right. and that might consume eight hours a week, let's see if we can take that off. How do we take it off your plate? Well, we can provide more resources to do that, or we can train people on some of those activities. And as we invest in people and bring more people on, that's some of the ways you can do that. None of this happens unless you can find cash flow opportunities to fund it. Right. So you can either reach, you know, an owner can reach into his pocket and dump the cash in the bank and then he go hire the people, or you can try and find inefficiencies, low hanging fruit, create more cash flow. Maybe it's pricing, maybe it's operational efficiency. Could be a whole host of things. It's the chicken or the egg, right? You know what? What's the what, what comes first? And I, one thing that's usually not an option in a small, at least the small businesses I've worked with mm-hmm. and consulted with and uh, worked in, you just can't work harder, right? Most people are working; they're they're busting it. You were a good example. You were working sixty hours a week. Uh, you still are. Uh, most you can't tell people, all right, go work seventy hours a week. You can do that, but and you can also say be more efficient. But when people are working sixty hours a week. They're, they're generally doing it with the mindset of, all right, we got to keep the lights on. So those are some tough things. You know, one of the things that there's a couple of things I've been through in the past with time management, and it's not, it's kind of related to time. It's uh, personality profiles. Mm-hmm. I've used the tool that, you know, there's Myers-Briggs. There is, uh, there's all these personality profile tests that tell you, all right, Bull, you're a ESTJ. That's the Myers-Briggs terminology. And that means you're an extrovert. You're a sensor. You, you've got these different personality characteristics that are very different than an introvert. Right? Sure. Uh, and I've used a bunch of them. But the one that is unbelievably insightful for me is called a DISC profile, D-I-S-C. What a DISC profile does, it basically gives you, what I love about it, there's no humans involved. Mm-hmm. You take a online, you answer a series of questions, and then it gives you a computer printout about how Mike Bull or Mark Olivito views the world. Mark is a driven person, goal-oriented person that loves praise. It gives you a three-page narrative. Every time I've done this, and I've done it with probably 50 people, and we've shared the profiles around, the, the printouts, Sure, 98% accurate. It is, out, it is amazing how accurate these things are. And then when you start to step back and you start to look at it, everybody is wired differently. You're not going to... And by the way, I've taken the same test at this profile in the year 2000. I think it was 2008 and 2016 identical scores every single time the only time the scores change is if you happen to catch it on a traumatic moment where <clears throat> car accident a family death that's the only times i've heard about these things changing so people are hardwired and they've got a natural tendency and then they've got an adapted tendency what the adapted tendency is when you're in high stress maybe a work setting that's not natural to you you're going to adapt your behavior now that's going to be yeah. energy consuming it's going to be stressful for you but people adapt their behavior but they're hardwired to be a certain way so for me personally uh the disc the d stands for dominance which is how time sensitive you are and it goes from zero to 100 100 being off the charts zero being you're not time sensitive at all you're going to do your own thing all those other dimensions accountants are in a different profile sales and marketing tends to be there tends to be a functional bias Mm -hmm. about how people are wired and you need all of these uh, the S stands for steadiness. Typically, accountants or lawyers are off the charts with the S factor, steadiness. 
They want the details. They want the procedures. They tick and tie all the boxes. Thank God they do. I've got zero zero ability for the S. I'm like zero. Accountants tend to be 70 to 80 to 100 in that area. Lawyers tend to be high in that area too. Interesting. Okay. They also, those accountants tend to be zero or below the line. If the the average was 50, they tend to be below the line on D. I'm 100% D. Driven, time sensitive, goal oriented, which creates havoc in the world of people that are more process driven. So, um, and then then they tell you what percentage of the population is at 100 versus 50 versus zero. Uh, so one percent of the population is one hundred percent D. I happen to be in that category. Mm-hmm. It creates madness in an, in an environment if I don't check that, because a lot not everybody's one hundred percent D. So anyway, the the point being the DISC profile. I'd highly recommend all business owners. You can do it for free. You can do an abbreviated version for free. It gives you a computer narrative, and then do it with your team. Get everybody plotted on the team to see kind of where everybody is in the spectrum. There's no right or wrong answer, but if you know and you have that, and you start having conversations about how people view the world then the communication starts happening a little bit better. It's a little bit more seamless. If you got the playbook to the other side, your teammates, Mm -hmm. life and communication tends to go a little bit easier. So not directly a time management thing, but people's hardwiring with time and goal setting is pretty important to understand. Interesting. How how does this translate into a time management curriculum, if you will? Uh, What what did that tell you about your team, uh, the results of the DISC? uh analysis what did it tell you what did it tell you about your team and did it did it point you in the direction of making improvements in regards to time management with them or how did that work well it helps with communication so you need to know how the other people that you're working with oh, are wired. yeah that's right okay. so if that if you've got nothing but conflict within a team time everything becomes harder not just time management sure so it's about knowing who you're working with and what people's preferred communication style is and then that tends to create a more cohesive work environment. So not a direct line to time management. Now, one of the other systems that I've uh, utilized or have been exposed to, it's a, kind of a dry read, but there's some good concepts in it. It's the four disciplines of execution. So it's an operating system. Mm-hmm. Then I, I believe the, the four disciplines are, number one, you're going to focus on the wildly important, right? And what is the wildly important? Well, that's for the business to decide. Is growth wildly important? Is people development wildly important? Is it innovation? Is it customer service? But you you kind of decide what is critical for a business. Sure. Wildly important. Uh, You want to create a cadence of accountability. Uh, There's a concept of having a compelling scorecard, which a lot of businesses do not have. What's a compelling scorecard? Well, a compelling scorecard, you know, picture week one and week 52. Week one, you start at zero, week 52, you want to be at $2 million of revenue or 500000 in profit, whatever it is. Well, and there's the line. And by week 26, you should be halfway there. You should be tracking with the line. If you're below the line, you're off plan. Mm-hmm. If you're above the line, you're ahead of the goal, right? So where are you versus where you should be? It's a compelling scorecard. It's updated every week. It's kind of like the basketball analogy. If you ever go to see a pickup game, the teams and the games that are keeping score they're much more fun to watch, much more fun to play. The teams that are in the games that are not keeping score, it's really, there's no energy involved. So a compelling score is pretty, yeah. it's pretty, it's pretty important. Yeah. And then the, uh, there's this concept of wigs, wildly important goals. So let's say the business has a goal. They've been at a million dollars for 10 years and they want to get to two within two years. Well, you got to start, like you said, break it down into smaller pieces. How do you have to get there? Every individual person should have a wildly important goal every single week, just one, that says you're going to pull yourself. There's this concept of the whirlwind, what we talked about before, the phones, the broken machinery. That's the whirlwind. It's stuff that's critical. It's got to get done um, or the business's lights don't stay on. A wildly important goal breaks you out of that and says, I got to take three hours this week. So not in a day, but in a week. Can you carve out three dedicated hours? to work on something that's going to advance the cause to the wildly important goal. So the whirlwind can't be an excuse. You've got no excuses. It's part of the equation. You're going to, it's not an excuse. You're going to set your own wildly important goal that ties into the, the broader scheme. We're going to measure it. It's going to be achievable, but it's going to be kind of hard for the week. But think about it. Three hours a week over the course of a year, that's 150 hours you just spent trying to accelerate the business into some wildly important goal. 
that gets the business accelerated. Mm -hmm. So then a challenge becomes for you. You have to figure it out. You've got your own whirlwind to deal with. You've got machines broken, the phone's ringing. How are you going to create three hours in a 60 hour week or a 40 hour week to try and dedicate enough time to do that? Exactly. So not easy, but, and then you got to get the cadence of accountability where the whole team is working on something like that. Mm -hmm. So the idea here is don't try and boil the ocean. Don't try and work 40 hours a week completely different than what you are now because the world one is important. You got to keep the lights on. But can you carve out three hours to work on something that's going to advance the company? So instead of working about a bro if broken machines are a big deal for you, maybe a wildly important goal is three hours a week. You're going to do preventative maintenance that you've never done before. You're going to actually build a preventative maintenance schedule for every piece of equipment in the organization with times and dates on when things get done. And is it the oil change? Is it new heads? What, what are those activities that you're not doing today? So instead of getting into a repair mode, you're getting into a preventative maintenance mode. That's going to require a retooling of thinking, and that might be an example of that. What's interesting about that, too, uh, the uh, wildly important concept that you're going after, e each individual person has to have one, or <clears throat> they're all doing it together as a group. But just like anything else, it's the and then. You've got to break it down into, okay, Bill, uh, why don't you handle this end of that? Uh, you know, uh, Stacy, why don't you do this? You handle this part of this you know, wildly important goal. Um, and then it comes together at some point. But everybody has to find the time to do that. That's right. And I think, uh, you know, people are the ultimate uh, enablers. The, the other thing that was, I think the other, one of the fourth disciplines was you focus on leading indicators, not lagging indicators. So a lot of organizations, they, you know, they'll pull reports up, whether they use QuickBooks, whatever system they use. Sure. And they look at last quarter sales or profits or last half year's sales and profits. Guess what? That's the rearview mirror. It happened already. A leading indicator says, what's going to determine the future? Well, what in our business, what determines the future is how many proposals or how many quotes are we given, right? So we know if we've given 100 quotes, our future should look a lot better than if we gave 25. Right. But right? all things being equal, the dollar per quote is the same. So a leading indicator is our quotes. If our quotes are up, that might not affect sales today, might not affect sales in the next 90 days. But in the future, if we're quoting more at a rapid pace, our future is going to look brighter than what it does today. It's a leading indicator of what the future looks like. Focus on that instead of the rearview mirror, which most organizations do, which is last month's or last week's sales. That happened already. You can't control it. It's done. There's nothing you can do about it. What you can focus on is things that improve the future. So uh, uh, it's a me, leading indicator versus lagging. Let me throw you a curveball. Um, wildly important goal. Let's take a couple of seconds. And again, this ties directly to time management. Let's take a couple of seconds we, uh, and talk about what we've got sitting on our floor right now. We've got a 14-foot uh, diameter compass rose. Uh, that has a build out and surrounding feel, which brings it out to about 17 feet. Okay, mm -hmm. so figure 17 feet by 17 feet. And it's in a product, porcelain, that we've never really dealt with before, sold or otherwise. However, in the ancillary industry that we're essentially tied to, outdoor which is living, outdoor living yep. uh, concrete pavers, uh, all those things, that all things horizontal at this point. Yep. Um, the porcelain is a new product, which is kind of taken the, uh, we, we, let's not say it's taking the, 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 the industry by storm, but it looks like it's going to. It might be, what do you think, 1% or 2% of all square footage out right, there? Right now, but you got to believe that at some point within the next two or three years, it's going to be 10% or more. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and our involvement has been limited at best, but it's always been, it's been top of mind. Address that a little bit in regards to the wildly important goal and how we wound up where we are right now with this particular order. Mm -hmm. So, Well, first off, luck is the best thing in, in life, in business, right? So uh, people came to us to see porcelain is a very difficult product to cut. If you ask any hardscape contractor out there, it's not concrete. It breaks easily. Mm -hmm. It's a very difficult thing to do, exactly. to install. So it's a problem. It's also an opportunity. We cut all day long. It's hard for us to do this. We got to figure it out. We we've broken a thousand pieces to try and figure this thing out. Um, but the first step is all right. It's only one to two percent of the industry, and who we we'd be speculating to say it's going to go ten percent. We don't know. Mm -hmm. But let's say it never grows at all. Here's a question that the business owner and the management team needs to decide on. 
if concrete, let's just say, is 98% of the world and porcelain is 2% of the world, would you rather have half of 1% of 98% or would you have, rather have a 25% market share in something that's 1% to 2%? Yeah. Let's, big, let's just say they both the, equal the same amount the big of big fish, little pond right. versus little fish, big pond. I, I would almost argue to say you got to think long and hard. I think I'd rather have 25% of the 2% right. or 50% of the 2% versus a quarter of 1% of the big thing if they create the same revenue. Market share is a key thing in business, I think. So being dominant in a niche beats being a spec in a big C, I think. That and doesn't mean they're mutually exclusive, but it's worth having that conversation. And if you're going and, and the nice part about that is if it does explode to ten, it explodes to fifteen, it explodes to twenty percent. You're all you're, you're situated. You've got your processes and protocols down. Electric cars you're ready to accept that. Right. Electric cars are only one and a half percent of all cars today. And Tesla's got 85% market share or something like they dominate. Tesla's got 80% of a segment that's only 1% to 2%. Almost a million cars in 2021. They're rocking. That's outstanding. But relative to the universe called cars, they're really insignificant. Right. They're 80% of a 2%. But where is the car market? And, and So in other words, internal classic cars are 98% electric or 2%. What's it going to look like in 10 years? You know, is it going to be electric cars represent 10%, 20%? All the manufacturers have said they're going all electric. It's just a question of, is that going to happen 2030, 2035? So now Tesla owns 85% of a sliver of the car market. But if these other guys don't, so the question is, is anyone, if the whole world moves to electric, you got to think Tesla is going to be the Mac Daddy of the entire car market. At least that's what their stock indicates, what investors are betting on, all of that. So that's kind of, now it doesn't mean that, Porcelain, back to our outdoor living world, is going to be 10%, 20%, or 30%, but you want to be there if it does. Even if it doesn't, you probably want to be there. That's exactly right. And one of the things I'm going for here, okay, the whole wig concept. Let me me finish one last point. Oh, sure. General Motors hasn't exactly been an innovator. I mean, Elon Musk, I love him. Uh, Polarizing individual. They sold 25 car, twenty five electric cars last quarter. Not 25,000, 25. I mean, it's a joke. It's an absolute joke what they've done in terms of their slowness to react. Compare porcelain, hardscaping, concrete to the electronic car market. All the concrete paver manufacturers, not all of them, but a lot of them, are they're dabbling in it. They're importing it from Italy. They're bringing in porcelain. Nobody's investing in manufacturing resources, that I can see, of the concrete paver. Man. There's one company that's built a plant here in America. They've got a head start. So the rest of the concrete world is kind of saying, this thing's never going to catch on. It reminds me of General Motors, Ford. They're all scrambling. They're all playing catch-up now. Sure. They're going to spend a fortune. And then, by the way, why, why did the manufacturers not change their business? Well, they've got billions of dollars invested in the old technology. Cars, internal combustion engines, concrete paver manufacturers. They've got millions of dollars in these plants. To convert over to something like porcelain is not easy. It's know-how. It's new equipment. There's all sorts of things. So there's, there's an interesting parallel. When industries shift, they shift and they leave carcasses on the, on the side of the road. They really do. We went down this road. And we I, got off the time management topic. Well, actually, I'm, <laughs> that's, I'm, I'm, I'm going to reel this fish in. Um, uh, we, got, we got interested in the whole porcelain end of this when you first came on board. That's where it was. Yep. And... Uh, there's, you were learning, and, and it's, it's, if you're coming from where I came from, or where Mick came from, or my brother Ken, or, uh, or Brian, it's, it's easy to fall back on, look, just expand on what you know, and keep moving in that direction. Okay. You, you asked, what do we do? Now we've got it, we've got one sitting on our floor. If it's the normal whirlwind of what paver art does, mm-hmm. we got a beautiful compass, we take a few pictures, maybe we do a video, we package it, we got to package it in a different way. It's, it doesn't behave the same way in shipping. We send it out the door and hope to get another one. That's kind of the whirlwind approach to, great, we did a new product, now we can put it on our website, hopefully we can get more. Or do we make this a wildly important goal that says, stop the presses? My position is that we, we already made this a wildly important goal years ago. When we looked at this, Every input that we got from all these ancillary sources, you know, uh, at least we, we talked to at least three manufacturers of concrete pavers who were bringing the material over from Italy mm-hmm. and stocking it. 
and trying to sell it in the United States in their particular respective markets. Have they made a dent, you think? They made a dent, but I think it's still a dent, okay? And they um, root against it within their own line because they got their own manufacturer on concrete. You you, you know the you know the whole con you, you you know the whole concept of marketing phases, okay? This is still slogging down in phase one. Maybe a couple of companies are getting into phase two marketing, you know, where they're uh, where they've made the commitment and they've got their salespeople, you know, uh, hyper energized to go out and sell this stuff, and then they've got plans of you know, manufacturing themselves and opening up their own plant to do so. Do they, you think? Possibly they do. Maybe one or two companies. Look, look, my experience is, I'll push back, salespeople aren't going to get it done. And I love sales. It's in my DNA. Mm -hmm. If you give a concrete paver or a general motor salesperson, which is like a dealership, right? and you say the world's moving to electric or the world may move to porcelain, mm -hmm. they're not going to get it done. They're just not going to get it done. You've got you've to cut the lifeline off and stop selling Internal, you got at some point you got to say we're going all in now. Maybe you phase it in, but they're not going to get it done. The, right. the world is filled with salespeople that have stuck to their core business that haven't innovated and gotten to the new one until okay. you force them to. Okay, Alvito, that's podcast number seven. Okay, so that's <laughs> the number seven is going. No, I'm just kidding. Anyway, we're, we're on a riff here, but hey, back to the porcelain mm -hmm. as it relates to time management. The whirlwind says we get it out the door, we ship it, we do, uh, we do our normal thing. A wildly important goal says. Stop the presses. Let's build the right marketing, the videos. Maybe we take the seven-hour road trip out to wherever this is going to go. Let's just say it's the Midwest. Mm -hmm. We talk to the homeowner. We talk to the architect. We get everybody involved. We really try to understand why did they pick porcelain over concrete? Get into the mind of the consumer. Mm -hmm. Now, what does that take? Well, it might take three guys going on a road trip, uh, and let's just say it's the Midwest. So you're going to invest 100 man hours <clears throat> in that project. So... At some point, you got to say, is that all worth it? Can you get it done? Or can you afford not to do it? Where's the lesson learned? To me, the lesson learned is in the birth of the concept. All right. When we first looked at it, the only thing that we were focused on was the fact that this material is very difficult to cut with the equipment that That's we right. currently own. Mm -hmm. Okay. Step one find a way to make that equipment adapt to and cut more successfully and reduce your defect rate uh, and waste rate as much as possible. Mm -hmm. We did some of that, okay? Uh, and it's, it's that wildly important goal, that wig concept where you have to carve out a certain specific period of time, you know, every week, month, quarter, whatever it is. Great example to figure it out. To figure it out. Now, we did do we did do some of that, but then we had the opportunity. We were introduced to an opportunity, uh, and quite frankly, let's be honest, we were we were we were dabbling in it at that point. What happened was, and where the uh, where the uh, uh, the line of demarcation came was when we were introduced to a potential project. Uh, actually, it wasn't potential; a project where they came to us and said, hey, can you build us this 17 foot by 17 foot area for this particular uh, residential property, uh, but we want to use porcelain. Oh, okay. I remember distinctly in this office. And, and our instincts were, how about you do concrete? That's our instincts. That's the first thing we fell back on. But when we realized that that wasn't going to be the case, we said, okay, this is a fish or cut bait moment. You know, mm -hmm. I'm sure there's, you know, I'm sure somewhere in one of Stephen Covey's books, there's a, there's a, he's got something about fish or cut bait. Right. Okay. But the bottom line was, do you throw caution to the wind and do this? Well, under normal circumstances, unless you've got, if you, if you had no previous experience with porcelain, you're yeah, going to probably say, no, we're not going to, we're not. Okay. Well, but we had enough to know, you know what? We, Brian's figured out some items here on how to cut this material. We might be able to make this work. Well, culturally, it's the but, owner. But the idea is we got it. It's it, it's sitting out there as we do this podcast, and it's gorgeous. It's beautiful. But culturally, you bring up a good point, which is at some point you got to make a decision. Do you actually go after the project or not? And if you've got right. more experience, you dabble with it, those all become easier decisions. But they are also a moment for the team to get together in a small business right. and say, we're either going to go all in on this thing in terms of, let's say, yes, and then have our reputations at stake to do it the right way, to figure it all out, all the unknowns, 
or you're going to say you're going to punt. Punting is a difficult thing to do because what you're saying is the collective team says we can't figure it out. Right. And boy, that for anybody that's a winner in life, to say that's we're not going to figure this out. That's a big deflator. That's a deflator, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, I hate being parts of teams that say we're not going to figure this out. Right. we got too much on our plate. It's just painful. Now, a lot of owners are conservative and they'll say, look, just we got plenty of business to do. We don't need this right now. Let's just keep doing what we got. we got plenty to say grace over. Um, and that, there's nothing wrong with that, by the way. Right. Uh, but it is a deflator. If you aspire to grow, you can't, you've can't. you got to have a mentality that says, let's figure this damn thing out. Well. You but your wake and time management, you've got to make that a wildly important initiative. And it doesn't have to be 40 hours a week. One guy doing three hours a week over 20 weeks might be enough. So when that opportunity or the luck happens, you've got enough confidence to say, let's get after this thing. Let's say yes. And what's interesting is what you what you just said is exactly what happened. Brian took that time, okay? He was taking at least three hours a week. We took the order. We actually took the deposit, right. okay? And um, uh, it, we made sure that the client knew this. They knew our position on this from the beginning. Right. Completely transparent. Uh, you know, we're not going to... You know, we're not going to deceive them in any way, shape, or form. We, we're, we're happy to do this, and we're happy to take the deposit. We're happy to take the order. And we're happy to go after this. Here's the parameters within which we need to work. And they, were, they weren't massive parameters. They were limited. Uh, you know, you have to do, there's, there's give and take there. But Brian had, the idea here is that, uh, you know, you and I can uh, spitball on this thing all we want. And, and John can, can put his two cents in. Brian was the one that was responsible right. for actually figuring out how to do this. And all what's not going to come up in this podcast is all the little nuances that he had to go through to figure out how, how they're going to make this fit exactly the way it's supposed to fit because you have very little, you know, the plus or minus tolerances on how this is going to fit into an already existing space were very, very tight. Right. On top of the fact that, okay, how are we going to do this without breaking three quarters of the stuff right. that we bring right. in? So uh, it's, I mean, it ties to, and by the way, the time management thing, he prioritized that. It goes back to the prioritizing when it comes to time management. He prioritized that. He got everything else done that he needed and, to get done. And I love that. You know, the rest of the business running. Oh, Kander, I love to say this was uh, methodical. This was a schedule that we had an R&D plan. We weren't anywhere near that structure. No. This was, hey, Brian, can you carve out a week or two or uh, a day or two to do some test cuts on a test company? I mean, we did this on the fly. Small businesses don't have a lot of processes. Anybody that says they do, they're lying. Right. Or at least I haven't seen them. So Brian's kind of doing it five minutes here, ten minutes here. The amount of time you spend on just putting, trying to figure out what those processes are going it's, to be, it's, it's my, very my difficult. Number. But the key is you've got to work on the business versus just doing the fire drills, the in the business, keep the lights on. If you don't have enough... Uh, test cuts, if you don't have enough uh, blood, sweat, and tears, when that opportunity or the luck comes along, you're not going to say yes. Or you're going to be saying, you're going to be gambling more than doing it with confidence. We had enough information. We had enough to say, we can figure this out. Exactly. We were, and, and yeah, was there a little bit of risk involved? Yeah, there was a little bit of risk involved. And, but at the end of the day, you know, we mitigated that risk with what we knew, uh, the time that it took to figure that out. Now, the, the challenge is, all right, the thing's done, we figure out the ship, and we get, how do you take that extra 100 hours, pull yourself out of the whirlwind and figure that out to get the full marketing plan, to get the full insights of the consumer, to see the contractor install it, to do all of that, to capture the video, to really learn to see it all the way through, so then you can build a business plan around it. That's the challenging part. The thought of, if you and I and Dominic were to hit the road and do that, and we abandon the phones for two hours or have the phones forwarded while we're on the road, mm-hmm. right? That's a pretty stressful thing to think about. And I think we, you and I, at the end of the day, we're gonna, we, we have no choice. we got to do it. Of course. We're going to figure it out. That's wildly important to our business to go see that through. We might not ever sell this another porcelain design, design in our lives. Still the right bet. This is not the first. This would not be our first rodeo with taking something uh, from the absolute start, from the absolute beginning and working its way through. We've had some experience with that over the last four years, and we've also had some experience with that at Paveart in general for the last 20. Yeah, what, what I would say is, from a small business owner standpoint, time management, none of this is possible if you don't run a tight ship. Right. If you don't have, if you're not well capitalized, if you don't have an adequate cash balance, and every business is different on what that means, 
either measured by time, weeks of payroll, weeks of rent, whatever that is, you can't make these bets. You're just too, you're running too lean. You're running too close to the pier. You've got to build up a financial wherewithal to be able to take some of these bets to work on a business, to carve out a half a day a week to work on digital marketing or things that you're not doing now. Mm -hmm. It's critical for the owners to do that. And if there's just not enough resources, there's not efficiency to find, at some point you got to, like your point on the chicken and the egg, you either got to bring in resources, but you got to start mapping those things out right. to figure out how to do it. You got to be financially stable. You can't you can't bet the farm and tank the company or the business because you don't have enough financial resources. And now you start thinking about how am I going to take a day a week to work on the business versus in it? That's reckless. You got to be you got to think of the whole pitch. The owner's responsibility not to put the business in jeopardy just because you're chasing growth. Growth is not for everybody. It's for 10 to 15 percent of the businesses. Um, but if you're going to go after that, you've got to be very methodical, very responsible on how you do it. Well, it's a, uh, especially when you're going into an economic downturn. It's a, it can be a daunting task for someone that doesn't have previous experience with time management. Understanding time management 